going on ladies and gentlemen? Josh Coker here, AKA Josh Miss Prime. You know what it is. Coming at you with a number, another episode of Polymathics, the channel that helps you become a modern day Renaissance man or woman. In this episode, we're going to discuss the hero's journey, also known as the monomyth. Also known, I'm coining the term right now, the metamyth. And we'll go into detail about that some other time. But the real thing that I want to talk about is there are two components that the metamyth or the hero's journey or the monomyth is comprised of. One, you have the plot, the story, the journey. And that is divided into other sections. For example, you have the first, second, and third act. In addition to that, you also have the outer journey, which takes place during those acts, and the inner journey, which takes place during those acts. However, the other crucial element to the plot, which is the action, what happens internally and externally, internally and externally, uh, the second element is the characters, particularly the archetypes. So in myth, as in psychology, um, there are these prototypical forms that we can identify with on a subconscious level with very little uh, coaxing, or not coaxing, with very little energy or effort required because they're so transcendent throughout all cultures and ages and sexes and and belief systems so I'll give you a good example um, an archetype is something like a mentor or a teacher that someone might call a mentor or a teacher or a um, let's see you might have a threshold guardian, which is someone who um, prevents the hero and his team from progressing before like, they have to have a challenge. Uh, you might call them a challenger. So like, you know, there, there are the coined terms that have been used, and then there are also, you know, terms that we use, we loosely use to describe them, but it's, um, it's kind of like if you were to uh, stand in front of a light and the shadow that is cast on the wall is going to be a human shadow. And so everybody who's human is going to say, oh, that's a guy or that's a girl, but they're going to know it's a person. Whereas if a dog stood in front of the light and then it cast the shadow, you'd say, oh, it's an animal or it's a dog. And then immediately your mind starts to think, okay, what are the characteristics? What are the prototypical characteristics of that, that archetype that they're visualizing? And the reason why that's so important is when you use these archetypes, they're very strong in getting your point across because they hit people on a deep subconscious level. And so, by doing that, you can connect with the readers very fast. It's very, it, it's, it's very easy to then, uh, you know, depict your story. So, with that being said, the what I'd like to do is talk about archetypes a little bit because I'm working on a series right now. I'm working on a, not a series, I'm working on a, what's the word I'm looking for? course. I'm working on a course right now that is going to be an advanced course in all of the different archetypes that you could possibly find in the hero's journey, aka the monomyth, aka the, the metomyth. Um, and the reason is because if you really know what these archetypes are and how they're used in modern fiction, then it's going to make it very easy for you to identify which character fits that archetype and then 
you'll know, okay, what are the major functions and roles that they have to, to portray thematically? And then also, um, where where do they show up in the story? Because not that it's not that uh, you know every story is the same and the same character arrives at the same time, but generally speaking, there's a time where one character, it makes more sense for them to arrive versus another, things like that. And especially for beginning art, uh, writers, authors, it's a good starting point so that you can focus more on the storytelling aspect and creating the characters and creating cool scenes and the dialogue versus trying to figure out, is this right? Should I do it this way? Should I do it that way? And while there is no right or wrong answer per se, when it comes to commercial fiction, and meaning fiction that is bought and sold, uh, oh, sorry, meaning fiction that is bought by customers and sold by authors for the purpose of making money and entertainment, there usually is a uh, there, there, I don't want to say a, a template, but for lack of a better term, there's a structure that readers are looking for in order to consume the content. And if you don't hit that, anyways, the point is the meta myth helps you hit that. So um, hit that mark. So with that said, let's talk about some of these archetypes. Now we're not gonna go into each individual archetype. Like I said, we're, we'll, we'll go over, I'm gonna give lots of examples. I've already done one on Minotaurs that I'm gonna release either shortly after or shortly before this video. Um, but in, in, in generally speaking, there are two types of archetypes that you'll find as a storyteller. Again, we're not talking about, uh, you know, psychologists who are analyzing their patients or zodiacs, symbols, because sometimes those are, you know, taken into account. We're not talking about literary characters. Again, I'm not going to go into a great deal of, of depth here, but there, there, there's a difference between an antagonist and a villain. And there's a difference between an antagonist and a villain and a shadow or a trickster. However, you might have a character that is fulfilling the trickster or shadow archetype act as a villain or an antagonist. But the difference is villain and antagonist, those are two literary elements or archetypes but they are not thematic or mythological archetypes. And that's the whole point. What we're dealing with right now for the purpose of our conversation is mythological archetypes because that's what's gonna give your story that real power and, and reach your audience on that deeper level. Among the archetypes, I would say that there are two primary forms of archetypes. They're, they could be put into two different sections. And I'm just gonna put a plug in right now. If you check out my book, and actually I have a couple, but right here I'll, I'll put it. Um, you'll see that I explain this in greater depth about the two different types of archetypes and, and things like that. But the there are stage archetypes and there are role archetypes. So let me explain the difference. A stage archetype is a character that you meet during a certain stage in the journey, in the story. So there may be, most characters have been introduced in the story by the second act. Very rarely do you introduce anybody else um, by the third act. It, and, and you, and even if it's like the, the hero finally meets this character in the third act, they've probably been mentioned more than once in the first or second act, even if it's just a casual mention. Um, but, shoot, where, where, oh, but there are stages where certain characters are introduced and then perform key functions, even in the third stage. So, uh, even in the third act. So, for example, 
nine times out of ten, very rarely could I see this going a different way, you're going to meet the hero during the one of the first stages, which is the mundane world. Or you might, some people, if you're, if you're going off of the old structure, and I don't want to confuse anybody right now, but if you're going off of, say, Joseph Campbell's structure, then it, it, it's like the call to adventure, where you find the hero in their mundane world, you know, going through the motions, doing the same thing, not really inspired by life. Um, anyways, that's where you would he meet the hero. And most likely, that's also where you would meet the herald. This is a character that comes into the hero's life unexpectedly many times that presents the hero with a call to adventure. And so that those are two just really, and, and there are many archetypes that have different functions during different stages. And so for example, the hero has the most because the story is about that hero. But um, if you look at like the mentor, the mentor has some functions that they perform early on in the story and then not that they have no function but then other characters take more of a primary role I'll, we'll say like the goddess or the sidekick character might have a primary role during different stages and then the mentor will come back and have another function that they have to perform so those are what I would call stage roles and the interesting thing about a stage role is that any character can perform it. So you might have someone who is the mentor and then also performs the role of goddess. Now, again, I, I can't think of something off the top of my head, but it, it could happen, right? So their role function is mentor, but they, they, they arrive at the goddess stage for whatever reason. If you're in like a long series of books, that makes a lot of sense that that could happen. So, that is a stage archetype. During a certain s s point in the story, the, the character will arrive and perform certain functions um, to give you, and then there are some that are extremely unique. For example, the dragon, okay? The dragon archetype is, like if you were to look at roles in a story, you're not gonna really find the dragon role archetype because that character is usually reserved just for the dragon battle. And it's usually this monstrous creature that takes the form of a dragon or a demon or a minotaur or some other gruesome creature and that's why it's considered a stage archetype meanwhile on the other hand you have role archetypes which are characters that fulfill a certain archetypal role throughout the majority of the story and so and again like you have your uh, we'll stick with characters we've already discussed the hero the hero is going to stay the same throughout the whole entire story. You may have a kingly hero and you may have an everyman hero that are working together, but they're both going to stay in that hero archetype throughout the story. Now, if you have a series of books, maybe your kingly hero or your everyman hero had five books dedicated to them and they completed their character arc they grew old, they did their mission, whatever it is, and now in the new book series, they are now performing the role of mentor. And a good example of this in, in modern film would be the Star Wars trilogies. In the, in the prequels, even though this is going out of chronological order, if you go in story order, Obi-Wan, for all intents and purposes, is the hero in that story, it's him and Anakin, but he is, he's kind of like the everyman hero, and he goes through his character arc, and then when that trilogy is complete, 
the next trilogy, which is you have Luke as the main hero, Obi-Wan becomes the mentor. Then after that trilogy, Luke, his character arc has been completed, and now several years have passed, and he, in the newest trilogy, he is the mentor. And so there you, there you have uh, an example of how a, someone who performed a role archetype in many different st mini stories, I guess you could say, um, eventually transitioned into another role based on you know the needs of the story. So that's, that's for large stories. For smaller stories though, for like an individual book or film, it's very unlikely for that to happen. Whoever is the hero is gonna stay the hero and whoever's performing the mentor function more than likely, and this goes for a lot of the characters, the shadow, the trickster, the shapeshifter, they're gonna stay in that role and, um, and perform that role. However, you may have, this is where it gets a little interesting. There's a difference between archetypes and personas, okay? And so a persona is like someone who's very protective and it, that would be the nurturing mother. Um, or someone who is the savior of all mankind. That is the, the actual, the Messiah or, uh, persona. And so sometimes those personas you might have different characters portray a different, an archetype, like a, someone who is a messiah persona portray the mentor archetype, but their persona is not gonna dictate what the archetype does. It's actually the other way around. The archetype is going to dictate what the persona does, but the persona kinda has to fit what that archetype would do. So it's unlikely that a, a, I'm trying to think of a good, oh, it's unlikely that a Amazon, which is usually like a warrior female uh, persona would take on a archetype and now I'm like drawing a blank like, what, what, uh, that would take on an archetype of like say the Herald now as soon as I say that I can think it I can see where it could happen but the point is, is like it, it really depends on uh, the the needs of your story but nine times out of ten that's not gonna fit and I've kind of deviated the point is these roles stick with a character for a pretty long time it's it's unlikely that they're gonna they're gonna change and then the third thing I will say that I I've casually mentioned in my books before is that some archetypes not some actually all characters they have their main archetype which is either their role archetype or their stage archetype but then they have their secondary archetype which is um, kind of like what they default to when they're not interacting in a thematic way, okay? So, again, thematically speaking, it's like what is the story's needs to perform the thematic, deliver the thematic message. Outside of that, though, that character might take on a completely different archetype. So I'll give you an example. Elrond from Lord of the Rings performs the goddess function, or you might say the divine, that's the more like updated term. They perform the, div the divine stage archetype. But when it comes to what their, their secondary role archetype is that they take on, that character takes on throughout the rest of the films, it is that of the parent or the father figure archetype. So um, that's, very important to keep in mind because then when you look at them from that perspective it's like okay a character can have more dimension to it than just the archetype uh, thematic role that it has to play and um, another good example would be both well let's Obi-Wan from Star Wars he when he when he's 
performing his primary thematic archetypal role, he is the mentor. However, when he interacts with other people aside from the hero, basically, he takes on the trickster role. And th I mean, he, he does so many things that, that are within the trickster role. When he first meets Luke, he does a crate dragon roar to trick the sand people into fleeing. When he meets, when, when they go to the cantina, right before they get in, they get stopped by stormtroopers and he uses a Jedi mind trick, trickster roll. When they get into the Death Star and he's going to uh, shut down the generator, he uses force push to make the stormtroopers that are guarding the gener uh, the the shield generator or whatever it is the the tractor beam um, he, he uses force push to make them think someone's there so that he can sneak past them trickster roll and then finally when he confronts Vader and and he does you know fights that ultimate duel he actually allows Vader to defeat him so that he can become one with the force trickster role and then if you look at it even deeper one more example is um, he doesn't necessarily tell Luke the whole truth about his father until after Luke discovers it so again all of these are what would commonly be found in the archetype of a trickster but Obi-Wan his primary thematic role archetypal role is that of mentor so hopefully that gives you an example and then uh, Yoda to a lesser extent has that same dynamic go on when he first meets Luke he pretends to be this old alien hermit that doesn't know much and then later on after he's kind of after he's kind of observed Luke for a little bit then he reveals that he is indeed the great Jedi Master Yoda so trickster role um, even though Yoda's primary role in in that stage that he's in it so th this is actually really interesting Yoda the stage that Yoda comes in is the goddess stage so he performs the role of the divine archetype his primary role uh, archetypal role though is that of mentor and uh, his secondary role as I said before is trickster so um, again this is just food for thought when you're developing your characters and it it'll by understanding how these archetypes work it makes it very easy for you to set up your characters in a real way that makes them believable that gives them depth and allows your audience to instantly connect with them and empathize with them on a deep subconscious level. Again, um, if you have any questions, go ahead and drop them down in the comments below. I'm creating a whole course on this and I'm gonna to continue to plug it throughout the series as I provide valuable information because I really think that once the, the course is ready and it's all set up, that you're gonna find the information that I put in the course is gonna be way more in depth than even this content that I'm giving you here now and it's going to be so valuable for your storytelling needs so that at any point in time you can say okay this character what do I need to do to set up for them you can click on that video and I'll walk you through with like all the different um, questions you should ask and all of the different um, items that you need to develop that character speaking of which last thing if you want, go ahead and click on the link below and I'm going to have somewhere, either somewhere up here or down there, I'll have a link that goes to some completely free downloadable PDFs where you can take a look at our archetype. Uh, I'll have a couple different things available. You can take a look at an archetype and then uh, download the information where it's like these are the questions the basic questions that I would ask about that given archetype and one one that I'll have down there is like the hero 
So what is the hero's flaws? Um, where, where are they in their normal world when the adventure starts? All these things so that you don't miss anything and so that when you, when you create that character and the environment, you have given it enough thought so that they feel like a fully fleshed out person and the world feels fully fleshed out. So go ahead and click on those. And um, again, if you have any questions, drop them down in the comment section below. If you like this video, give it a damn like. If you wanna hear more, subscribe, you know the deal. And until next time, uh, take it easy. This has been Josh, AKA Josh Miss Prime from Polymathics, the channel that helps you become a modern day renaissance man. And I'm coming to you on behalf of Story Ninjas, story-ninjas.com, stories that pack a punch. Go ahead and check us out. And uh, that's it. Take it easy.